False accusations are a tool of abuse. The leave your head spinning, lynched with a noose. A pitchfork mob, unconcerned with truth. But it never happens, till it happens to you. I was awoken by uh, some heavy banging on my door. Walked up to the door and there was two officers there. They took me into the house. And before I had a chance to think, handcuffs were placed on me. And I said, I haven't done nothing. And she said, yeah, you can't tell us that, she said, because you needed to tell that now when you get to the station. I don't even know what they're here for yet. You know, they haven't said you're accused of this, this and this. And I said, look, you need to give me some more information what's going on. And he says, well, we are here, OK, because um, an allegation has been made of sexual assault. I mean, my mouth just dropped. I just didn't understand what was going on. And they said, uh, a woman's claim that you sexually assaulted her. And I have to say, my first reaction was to laugh. This is so ridiculous. I thought somebody was playing a practical trick on me from work. I honestly thought that the boys had got together in work and were, and, and were, were doing this and that the police would take me down the road and halfway to Collindale police station they'd open the back door and said, ah, I got you, walk home. I thought, what? Me? I, I, I honestly, I couldn't believe what was happening to me. But uh, I very quickly realised that it, it wasn't a joke, it was deadly serious. I challenged her because I know my husband, he's an idiot, but he's not a sexual predator. The officer said, don't worry, it's nothing serious. It's not, it's not like a rape or anything like that. Um, but it has been a historic, abuse, a historic allegation made against you and the nature is sexual. So they walked me to the car, which for some reason they want to park halfway down the road. Thanks for letting everybody, you know, it's like the walk of shame. You know, it's the scariest time of my whole life. Scary, nothing's worse. Nothing's worse than that. For, for a man, you know, because I love ladies and look, look after ladies, you know. But to be accused of averting one of them is not right. Put me in the car. Um, I was like, I've got to go to work and they're taking the notice of it. You know, you plead kind of to the, you know, thinking that they're going to know the truth. But they're, obviously they're only doing their jobs. Um, they arrested me, said, look, you know, this is what's going to happen to you. You'll be... Um, put in the police cell for a while, you'll be interviewed and then probably bail to another address. Now the gate opens, the car goes in, the gate closes, and that's you gone. That's your freedom gone, that's everything gone. You are now not allowed to go out unless these people say you can. You've got to take your belt off and your shoes off and uh, you know, to empty your pockets. Fingerprints, DNA, photographed. Uh, put in a cell for a couple of hours while you're waiting. I had no solicitor at the time, so I had to wait for a duty solicitor. I was in some tiny little room, like, like a bloody, like a phone box first, glass thing. Like a holding thing, they said that was. It, it's horrible knowing that there's people in the cell screaming and shouting, banging next to you, and you don't belong in that place. You know in your head you don't, and then your, your mental health just starts deteriorating so quickly the, the, from the second that you walk through that door and they shut it behind you of that I'm, I'm not supposed to be here and you can't you don't want to be the person that's screaming and shouting let me out let me out because you look crazy but that's what your head is doing your head is sitting there telling you the, ask them questions they must have made a mistake this must be wrong you know where's this come from who said it who's done this who's done what you know where could this have possibly got to this stage and then some 16 hours later I was uh, interviewed and all these allegations were put to me. They took the lawyer aside, explained the charges, and then my lawyer came in. She said, well, actually, it, it is a rape. There's the two charges of rape they're putting against you. Two coppers sat opposite me and, and then it starts. And, and uh, they start interviewing me about something I know absolutely nothing about. But they're adamant that it's me. I was shown a very, very blurry uh, photocopy of a CCTV still and I was presented with this and asked if that was me so I look at this very blurry black and white image which vaguely looked like me but I couldn't be sure I mean I was at that point I was assuming that I'd been confused with somebody else so I said well it looks like me but I can't be a hundred percent certain 
and they took that as a denial. And you know, I'm, I'm trying to think back, it's a long time ago, so I, I took a little bit of time to think back because I'm trying to be as honest as possible at this stage um, and cooperate. And that got taken as a sign of guilt instead. And it's weird how those things can just be jumped on. Um, and it's very easy for it to be jumped on. It was quite obvious that the police officers interviewing me didn't believe a word I was saying. Now, you know, as a sort of nice middle class boy, it, it was, it was a, a tremendous shock to have people uh, not believing a word of what you say. I can't begin to explain how stressful that was. It was two hours, two hour interview, maybe, maybe longer. And they were asking me questions I could not answer because I simply didn't know the answer to the questions, you know. Uh, some, of, some of the questions I could answer truthfully because they would be personal to me. They would ask me, um, do you have an alarm clock in your bedroom? I was like, well, yes. And you start thinking, well, yeah, but you have an alarm clock in your bedroom, surely, you know, everybody's got an alarm clock in their bedroom. They say in the beginning of the meeting, uh, what will happen if you don't bring something up which you may relate to rely on court? And you've already been told to say they will think I'm lying. So you've told me to say this, then you've turned the camera on, and now it's me that's telling the courts that if I don't, if I see something later that I don't bring up in this video, you have to think I'm lying. That's the way I saw it. Mm. I might remember something later. You know, you don't remember everything, do you? Sometimes you don't remember where you put your keys. So to see them drooling with contempt almost at, at, at what I was saying, when I was saying, I never did any of those things and I don't understand why she would say such things about me, was deeply shocking. When you leave that interview room, you feel like the scum of the earth. You really do. And you think, my God, you know, and, and then you start questioning yourself, did I do, did I really do that? Um, and it's, it, it, it messes with your head big time, you know, because you're trying to remember something you didn't even do. And that's hard, you know. <laughs> and in the end, you start convincing yourself, well, you know, perhaps I was drunk, perhaps, I, I don't know, I, I really don't remember doing that at all. I just, I was in a totally different world. I'd always believed in the British justice system. I'd always believed that it would act fairly. And here I was, accused and treated as guilty. He just felt alone. Solicitor doesn't care anything. He's just doing his job. There, he loses, he loses, but it's not on the basis of him. Eventually, I was let, uh, I was released on bail, um, told to come back in three months. Uh, when, I, when I got home, my wife informed me that the police had come round while I was in the cells, searched the house, looking for paedophilic images, presumably. Uh, they must have been a bit disappointed because they didn't find any, but they did take my computers. Now they did say, um, you can give it up voluntarily or we'll get a warrant and tear your house apart. So I just said, well, you can, you can take whatever you need. Um, and my God, we had a lot of computer equipment, uh, the Kindles and uh, laptops, MacBooks, phones, the lot, you know, they, they took everything basically. They took my wife's phone as well. We later, of course, discovered even more amazingly that the police never actually looked at the computers and that, that really stunned me. Why, well, you know, if they bother taking it just to not look at it, I don't know, but there you go. Then we waited and we waited and we waited. And my solicitor was told it had gone to the Crown Prosecution Service, fine, so we wait a bit longer. Then we hear that the lawyer working for the CPS had just gone on maternity leave, so somebody needed to start the case over again. Being on bail is the worst thing because you know they're investigating you um, and you know it's going to take a long time and every living moment you are suffering. All my details were put on, on Facebook, uh, my name, my address, um, about personal information about my daughter, um, and it was just... Calling him a rapist. Calling me a rapist. And, and it a child much abuser. A, a witch hunt. Uh, to, it was basically saying, well, here's a free-for-all, this is where he lives, this is what he looks like. The, the fact of the matter is that she used to hit me a lot. I'll wake up several times with her hitting me. I've got photos of injuries that I have from her hitting me. Um, I had to call the, the police one time to my house about her hitting me. Um, 
so to read this, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe that she was saying it. I knew that she wasn't right in the head, but I couldn't believe she was saying that I'd abused her, um, knowing full well what she'd done to me. I don't want to be the man that's, that lives in this community and he's a rapist or he's the, he's the one that beat his, 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 his woman or whatever, because you know, people don't know the truth, they just hear it. I've heard so many stories, I've known of situations where people's houses have been attacked because of someone's alleged something, a woman alleged that this man touched uh, his child in an inappropriate way. He didn't in the end, but it didn't stop, stop a mob from blocking out the whole of this massive road where I live and attacking his house. We have had uh, the front door um, broken, the lock broken, we've had the back door uh, trying to be forced open, we've had uh, the skeleton of a dead cat. With its skull removed its outside skull our back door. Uh, very carefully positioned outside our back door. We've had the car tyres slashed. We've had, um, I've been verbally abused in the street. I've had eggs thrown at me. Um, and uh, we've had someone who uh, attempted to come into our house with a sledgehammer while the kids were present. I spent two hours on top of an eight storey car park um, not knowing whether to jump off or not. Um, in the end, I didn't. I, I thought about my son, I thought about my mother, I thought about I, I don't want to leave these people behind. But at that time, I didn't see another way out. I thought, this is all I can do is end it. My whole Google search for days before was, what's the quickest way to end it? How do I do it? You know, I scoped out different places of where I could do it. There was thoughts of suicide, you know, here and there along the way because of sheer despair that I couldn't get access to my daughter, the courts weren't listening, and I was made homeless. All my things were still in my home. I wasn't allowed near the house, you know, and there's that kind of despair that you're just living out of a suitcase in someone else's spare room. And I'm bailed to my parents' house. My parents don't really know um, it, I try to tell them the ins and outs, but they don't know whether I've done it or not. You know, it's um, and my father's an ex-copper as well, which uh, <laughs> was a bit awkward. I mean, they, they, they were fully supportive, um, but there seemed to be all this element of, oh, you've, you've done something silly on the internet, have you? You know, and it's like, well, no, I haven't. My depression began to be replaced by a kind of determination to uh, get justice on this. Uh, it worked. I stopped, my suicidal feelings went away and I began to feel, instead of feeling afraid and depressed, I began to feel more angry and determined that um, I was going to expose my accuser for what she was, a liar. I did speak to the officers. I, I demanded to speak to them and find out what was going on. You know, how come this is taking so long? You know, I want to be, I want to be charged so I can get to court and prove my innocence or I want to just be let go. I used to phone once a fortnight, once a week, sometimes twice a week, uh, just, just, just frantic, um, just pulling my hair out, uh, crying. The per very person that's investigating it, I was the one that was asking, you know, okay, well, has a decision ma been made yet? You know, have, have you finally found the truth? Um, and I'm, my anxiety is kicking in because I'm in the middle of my university degree. I'm at work. I'm, you know, I have a normal life. I just let them know that I wasn't going away and that they better do their job. Because the longer you sit around, the, I've seen in cases, some evidence goes, slightly goes missing because of the circumference of time. They tell me things like, you know, we've got sympathy for you, we understand, but it's just the way it is, this is how it's gonna be. These things take ages, we've got loads of allegations like this since the uh, reforms to legal aid. Um, we're stacked out with this kind of stuff. We turn up to the police station and the solicitors that I've just been given that I had no contact with turns up. Um, but the police officer in charge doesn't. No, we waited two and a half hours outside and my solicitor was a wonderful man, um, bless him. He decided to say that because of the waiting time, there's a strong possibility that I could be being charged and they're just making preparations to charge me. Little obviously did he know that the police officer in charge just wasn't turning up um, and they couldn't get hold of him. I was rebuilt six times for over a year. Obviously my employers couldn't continue paying me for a job I wasn't doing. 
you know, so that led to me losing my job. It was, it was such a profound shock to me to, to realise, as my solicitor informed me, that uh, if this would come to trial, and he warned me that it probably would come to trial, that uh, I then stood a significant chance of being found guilty, and if I was found guilty of all these charges, I would be likely to serve a prison sentence of about 15 years. When I was in the uh, Magistrates Court in, in Wales and, and I was sent to the Crown Court for trial, one of the lawyers who was there touting for work actually said to me, he said, um, oh, he said, you're part of the witch hunt. Oh, he said, gosh, we've had hundreds. He said, they're going for clergy, doctors, lawyers, anybody they can get their hands on. He said, I wish you luck. I wish you luck. You're up against, you know, a, a witch hunt. And that was his estimate. And all of this added to my burden of thinking, how on earth am I going to defend myself against these accusations? I was offered a, a plea deal of, I think it's three and a half years, or something like that, or seven years, or something stupid, um, to plead guilty. And I'm a very stubborn person. It's just my personality. I've probably got it off my mum. My mum's pretty similar in that respect. But I was stubborn enough in the sense of, we didn't even know that the evidence to prove I was innocent was there. But we was adamant that I was going to be able to get up into a courtroom and look the people in the eyes and say to them outright, this did not happen. This was a lie. I'm going to uh, also prove that I could not have been where I was accused and that I could not have done it. But I was going to prove it. Not her word against mine, not she said, he said, not uh, no corroborating or substantiating evidence, and maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. I'm going to prove that I didn't. Trial date kicks in and on the first day of court the first thing that happens is oh by the way we, we kind of missed that actually it's 13 counts of sexual assault and rape sorry uh, we've just reread the um, statement and there's one separate sexual assault count so we're gonna we're, we're asking the judge to, to put up to 13 sexual assaults and, and rape counts and that was obviously the prosecution that did that and that's your first moment. That's the first thing that's decided in court. We'd waited for four or five hours because there was a trial that carried over. Fair enough, it happens. Then they couldn't find a jury on the day, so they asked for any of the admin stuff to be dealt with now, and everyone will go home. So I spent an hour in the courtroom, and actually spent, actually, in court, it's in the actual court itself, probably about five, six hours. The first trial was a hung jury. The judge sent them out, they came, they came back with, uh, they couldn't agree, the judge sent them out and they came back again. He, he wanted a, a, a 10 to 2 verdict, but they couldn't come up with it. So we had to have another trial. The second trial, halfway through, the judge stopped the prosecution and told the police to go away and do their job again, because actually they had no evidence against me. And the medical report clearly stated there was no injuries, there was no evidence of penetration, there was none of his DNA found on her inside, on her clothes. There was absolutely not a scrap of him on her. No injuries, no bruising, anything like that. Even though the police were later to say in child protection that, that there was clear... Strong DNA evidence. St yeah strong DNA evidence. And we, we got an expert to look at the CCTV and they, the CPS tried to stop him um, coming to court. He, he wrote a statement on what he saw in the CCTV and he said it, what, it didn't fit with what she said. So our lawyer then pressed her. He said, well, can you please explain why, if you had all these injuries, why was the medical report said there wasn't? Oh my God, apparently she took off like a rocket. She screamed at our lawyer. I effin did, I effin did, I scrubbed myself, he's a dirty bastard. She called the judge to see you next Tuesday. I won't say the word. She made threats to kill my husband. She said she should have sorted it herself. I'm not going to the effin police, I shouldn't have done it. I should have sorted it myself. Threatened the solicitor. She oh. threatened the solicitor. We met again. Some weeks later, the prosecution came back to court in Bournemouth and I was placed in the dock again by the judge. And the judge then announced, the prosecution is very sorry for a wrongful prosecution 
and I'll award you compensation. You are now free to go. That was not the end of a story. It was so abundantly clear to a neutral person that I was innocent from the examples that we'd given in court that it would have been abundantly clear before I was even arrested. So this was a whole big waste of time. This was two years gone for no reason. You know, I've heard people say they've, they've broken down in tears or they've, they've been elated. I just felt nothing. I just felt numb. I just thought, what the hell was all that for? A whole year of my life. And the whole court trial had been a pantomime. Everyone there knew what I was being accused of wasn't possible. And yet everyone just carried on playing their, their role. The whole matter could have been resolved if they'd investigated, if they followed all reasonable lines of inquiry. Yeah. They would have discovered the lies very early on instead of dragging us through courts. I think the police were not interested one bit in, in the truth of the matter at all. What they wanted was a conviction. This whole thing is driven by performance, by statistics, it's driven by political dogma, it's driven by ideology, it's driven by all these things when we believe as people, I have always believed as people, that the justice system stands separate. That actually it's the law in this land that makes Prince Philip and me pay our taxes on the same day. And without law, without the impartiality of law, we're finished. What have we got? Okay, so everything is sorted out then. You've been told by the judge that you're not, not guilty. You've been told by the prosecution that they actually don't have any evidence against you. Um, you've been informed by your own barrister uh, after, uh, after the trial that this woman has been confabulating, which is fantasizing, reliving something that happened to her many, many years previously. Go away, relive your life. Pick up where you left off. But you can't. I still haven't moved on with my life. I'm still picking up the pieces. Um, I nearly lost my house. I ne ne nearly at the point where I could not, no longer pay the mortgage. Um, I couldn't pay any money towards my children's upbringing, uh, uniform, food, because I just physically didn't have the money because I couldn't go to work. I'd lost my job. The two boys we were fostering were taken away at the beginning of the investigation. Haven't seen them since. Um, weren't even allowed to say goodbye to them. You may have heard of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a mental and psychological and emotional condition in which you lose the ability to concentrate, to think, to communicate with people, to sleep, even to walk. I began to develop all these stiffness problems in my joints. First it was my knees, then it was my hips, and then it moved up to my shoulders. And um, I always remember, I, I, uh, we went on holiday in the Isle of Wight, we had three days in the Isle of Wight, and I remember my uh, wife looking at me walking along uh, the promenade uh, in Ventnor and, and saying to me, what's wrong with you, Steve? You're, you're walking like a 200 year old man. First port of call, of course, is your GP. Right, I've, I've been diagnosed with PTSD. I've been asked to come and see you. First thing they do is give you drugs. Sertraline was the drug that they gave me. Um, so you're taking these antidepressant pills. I don't like popping pills, but uh, that's what I was told to do, so I did it. Um, after a couple of months on sertraline, you go back to the doctors and they say, well, are the tablets working? And you say, I don't know. I don't know how I'd feel if I wasn't taking the tablets. Um, so it, you end up in that cycle where I'm taking these tablets, I have no idea whether they're having any effect or not. I'm still feeling very down, um, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm suffering in work because I can't meet deadlines, I'm thinking about all these different things all of the time, I'm just not the person I used to be. And then you just wake up in floods of tears. Sleepless nights, the anxiety, the shaking, the panic attacks. The fear of women. I get nervous when I'm on a tube. I get nervous when I'm on the escalators. 
you know, the, even travelling here today, it was quite busy. So I sat three seats away from somebody because I just don't like being in close proximity to anyone. If a tube came along and it was packed, before the trial, I would have done what every other Londoner does, and that is squeeze my way in and push my way in and strap hung all the way until I got home. Now, I won't do it because the likelihood is that I'm going to crush up against some woman and that I could very easily be said, you know, to be sexually assaulting her. The overall effect that this had on me, as I say, um, self-medicated, self-medicating isn't the answer, um, but it's an answer. Um, I've tried the drugs that they give you in, in, the, in the doctors and they really weren't helping. I was finding that, you know, just drinking a bit more alcohol numbs the pain. Um, but then you you become self-centered then and you don't realize the effect that that's having on people around you, which is where relationships start to fall apart. Um, and once you realize that, when you end up in the position where you, you, you've got a family and you're living on your own in a tiny, tiny little flat, um, lonely most of the time, you start really questioning, you know, I need to pull myself together here, you know. I mean, I'm sure eventually I'll, I'll get back to some semblance of normality, but once this has happened to you, your whole, your whole attitude to the judiciary, the police, society in general, it, it, it's altered for good. The old Suzanne has died. I am this angry, at times bitter, cautious, still afraid, and I've got to live like this now for the rest of my life until justice is done. I don't see this as a fight between the falsely accused and true survivors of sexual assault and rape. I believe we've both been through terrible things, you know, different in their experiences, but both utterly traumatic, horrible things. And the people who are to blame are the false accusers. It can't be vengeful. Um, because otherwise all we're going to do is actually end up completely ruining the lives of people that have been through the, the experience of being raped. Um, but I think if we're, what I'd ask other people to do is if we're willing to accept the fact that it does happen, we need people on the other side to start accepting the fact that false accusations do happen. The enemy is false accusers. People who are battling to clear their name and say I'm innocent, who are innocent, they need to be given that presumption of innocence. That is what our entire way of life. That's why people say the British system is the best in the world. It's because it's based on that theory that everyone is innocent until proven otherwise. We don't live in that world anymore. You're guilty until you can prove you're innocent. You know, which obviously is the reverse of what I always believe the British um, justice system was all about. The fact is, the way the legal system works now, today, for you and for me, is that if someone accuses you of a sexual crime, you are the perpetrator. That's what the legal documentation calls you. And it calls the accuser the victim. Now, this is not just a wrong use of words. I mean, grammatically, it's incorrect, of course, as well, because you're not actually guilty, a perpetrator, until you're found guilty. Um, but it's also a way for your accuser to get compensation from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. The criteria they have is that there only needs to be a balance of probabilities that she's telling the truth. This has gone from one extreme to another. The first extreme being all sorts of horrendous things were without doubt going on as far as abuse of children and other people was concerned. But with the publicity given to the Jimmy Savile case, it rocketed right over to the other extreme where so many people seemed to jump on the bandwagon and make allegations and actually were very often given compensation before anything was proved or, or not proved. The CBS should be impartial or a bit more impartial than that. They should look at the evidence. 
They shouldn't be driven by the ideology. I don't think anybody should be arrested if it hasn't already been investigated, because if you investigate it and you find actually there's nothing there, or you think that there could be something there, you just can't find the other evidence, so you need to question the other person. I can understand that. I can understand somebody needing to be questioned. That is a process that just needs to happen. But to be charged, to go through the court process, to do all of that, and the evidence, now people are telling me that the evidence wasn't even looked at still. A police officer's job is to investigate and to find out. And what we had was a very political case where police wanted to get their conviction rate up at any cost. It makes you realise just how far people in authority will, will go just to get the ends that they want. They're not interested in justice, they're not interested in the truth. I wrote to the CPS, I went on their website, I actually uh, wrote um, uh, the first stage complaint form, went all the way through it, and up until today, and that's four years, nobody has responded, nobody has replied, nobody has acknowledged, nobody has done anything. So they're not interested. I went public with my case two years before Liam Allen hit the headlines. When I went to the CPS and I met the head of legal services, he said, his words were, lessons will be learned from this. Nothing was learned. They had no intention of learning any lessons. They just carried on in worse than they'd been with my case. If you're falsely accused, no one cares. You're, no one cares because you're irrelevant. It doesn't really happen that often, so. Don't minimise the experience that we've had by saying it never happened. Don't, don't brush us off and brush us aside as if we don't matter. We've been through serious trauma. And to just have our experience thrown away so briskly as if, well, it doesn't matter because it never happens, that's not the case. And nobody knows how often it happens, but I know what happened to me. And I know it's happened to other people too.